Uh, we will begin very shortly. Um, I've been told that I have to um, turn off my video because of, uh, because of my audio that's been breaking up. So I'll turn off my video for a while, uh, or maybe throughout the webinar uh, due to some, some technical issues. Uh, we will begin very shortly. Never a day goes by that we ever stop talking about COVID-19 pandemic or hear the word coronavirus. It has always been a topic of conversation everywhere and every day because of the significant impact it has on our daily lives. This is something we have never seen or experienced before. No industry or sector is escaping the disruption of COVID-19, including our very own tuna industry. Hello everyone, welcome to our um, InfoFish second tuna webinar on tuna trade and markets evolution and opportunities. I am um, Apimalek Vakana Singa, and I will be the moderator for this tuna webinar. Recognizing the importance of the global tuna industry during this health crisis, as well as the unprecedented challenges that have risen in the tuna markets, we have with us today uh, a fantastic group of panelists and experts on tuna trade and markets from various backgrounds and regions. To introduce our panelists today, we have Ms. Fatima Ferdaus, uh, a freelance consultant who is well-versed and familiar with international fishery trade and marketing. She has 33 years of experience in working as um, advisory capacity with the fishery industries, policy makers, and development organization in the Asia Pacific, Latin America, and Africa. So in this webinar, um, she will be providing her views and opinions from the Goldwood Tuna markets and also from the Asia Pacific viewpoint. From the Middle East region, we have Mr. Arnab Sengupta, who is a consultant for Can Fast Moving Consumer Good Products uh, for Middle East and uh, North Africa. He has over more than 20 years of experience in building and developing markets across the Middle East and North Africa for canned tuna. Uh, representing EU, we have uh, Mr. Juan Manuel Fiertes Pabdista de Sosa. He is the General Secretary of, for the National Association of Canned Fish and Seafood Processors and uh, National Technical Center for Fish Products Processing. 
He also acts as the president of the of Eurothon Spain and the general secretary of the Spanish Federation of Association um, of Processing and Trading Industries of Fishery and Aquaculture. We are also honored to have with us today Mr. John Connolly from the US. He is the president of the National Fisheries Associ uh, Institute, America's leading trade association advocating for the full seafood supply chain. Um, he holds respectable positions in various associations and councils, such as the, the International Coalition of Fisheries Association, Marine Stewardship Council, the International Seafood Sustainable Foundation, and All Fish Board. A very warm welcome to you, our panelists, and thank you for being here with us. Just before we, uh, we begin, there are some housekeeping matters that needs to be addressed to all the participants present in this webinar. Um, we have a uh, simultaneous interpretation during this webinar. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, you will find uh, an interpretation tab. Or, and if you click onto that, you will see um, English and Spanish options. One of our panelists, Mr. Juan, will be speaking in Spanish throughout the webinar. So I kindly request that you switch uh, or click onto English on the interpretation tab at the bottom of the screen. Uh, for Spanish listeners, we have interpretation from English to Spanish. Uh, therefore, you can click on the uh, Spanish uh, options. For those that would like to, uh, um, for those, those panelists that would like to post a question to the panelists during the, the webinar, please do so in the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen. We will have these questions directed to the panelists towards the end of the webinar. Um, we apologize in advance if we missed out on some of your questions. However, we will try to get the panelists to answer all your questions depending on um, time availability. We uh, will also be providing a um, set of four questions for you to fill. Uh, we would appreciate if you could take time to answer these four questions during or towards the end of the webinar. Uh, we also encourage participants uh, to provide your feedbacks on today's webinar on the Zoom chat box. Uh, this would be really uh, helpful to us. So just to uh, kickstart our, our webinar today, let me just inform you all the, on the flow of the webinar. We will begin with a, a five minute brief presentation by each panelist on the current situation on tuna trade and markets globally and in their respective regions. Uh, we will also be, uh, they will also be talking on, uh, on pre-COVID expectations, current, current challenges faced by vendors, though many markets have opened for business and also their two year forecast. So after all the presentations, we will then have discussions with each panelist. So to begin our brief presentations, I call upon Fatima to firstly provide a brief global scenario on the tuna trading market. Fatima, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, all the friends around the world. Nice to see you, Arna. Good morning or good afternoon. You are in India. Juan Manuel, nice to see you. John, good morning to you. Now, um, I have to finalize the global trade in five minutes. Uh, I, on the slide, I put a kind of a history between 2007 and 2019 and, and a little bit on, uh, during the, for the first quarter of 2020. 
So as you can see that, um, you see the trend in 2019 and the, and the changes against 2001. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. So, um, in, in 2019 annual trade for canned tuna, uh, there were, this is the second slide. I need to take that off. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to. Okay, sorry, there are some technical problems going back to the slides. Okay, right. So we, we, we see some positive changes in last year's annual import for Cantona. And it suddenly increased um, significantly during the first quarter of 2020. And, uh, and there are positive changes also during the first five months of 2020. Now, looking at the, the top market, that is the European Union, uh, we, we see quite a bit of an increase in January, March. And in, in most of the markets and the top markets among the European Union was Spain, Italy, Germany, the Netherlands, the UK, France, Portugal, Belgium, Poland, and Greece, the top 10. And imports increased at almost all markets except in France, and of course, Spain, Italy, Todos los mercados menos el francés aumentó la, la importación. Y bueno, en España también. The UK, Belgium, Poland, and Greece, uh, they were all, they all bought products for direct consumption, either in the retail trade or in the industry or in the uh, restaurant trade. And uh, in, we see the same trend in the European Union. It has imports went quite up during January, May, compared to oh, last year, it was about 12%. Same thing is in the USA as well. And um, the panic buying during, during the early months of COVID break, uh, uh, outbreak, that is February, March, there were more sales at the retail, but very, very, uh, depressing sales at the catering trade. But nonetheless, the, the purchases that, that actually took place during January, March, they supported the panic buying in the retail trade in most of the markets. And uh, uh, it kind of settled down by April. So the panic buying we, we, we saw in February to mid April, it it has also um, kind of, of uh, uh, settled down, as I said, in, 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 during, from April onwards. But nonetheless, imports in April and in May, the cumulative imports in the European Union were 12% higher. In USA, it was 14% higher. In Japan, 3%. Saudi Arabia, 9%. And Australia also increased, Canada also 18%. Other markets like Russia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia, uh, also we see increasing trends of canned tuna. Now looking at the, um, at the export market, let's look at the export slide in the next one. Yeah. Um, we see positive trends in the export trend as well. And these are the top exporters, Thailand, Ecuador, Spain, the Philippines, Indonesia, and China. And uh, as we look at Thai export trade uh, trend, Thai exports increased quite substantially, particularly a 41% rise in the United States its stock market uh, compared to the same period last year. Exports, Thai exports also increased to, to Japan and to the other markets. And um, uh, Thai 
processes tell us that the import demand for canned tuna was high from mid-April, from sorry, mid-February to April to replenish the empty shelves that actually the, the panic buying took place during the early months of pandemic. But it kind of softened down from May onwards. And, uh, and, and the same trend, positive export trend, we also see during January, May, Thailand continue to export more compared to 4% of 4.6% rise in, in January, May, it went up to 6% due, uh, sorry, in January, March, it up to 6% in January, May, Equator also increased to 6%. Spanish exports went up by 4.6% during January, May, Philippines by 16%, and so on and so forth. So we do see uh, positive changes in the canned tuna trade until, until May. The June import data is not yet available. Um, if I go back to the next slide, and that will be basically for non-canned products. So in the canned tuna sector, what we have seen that most of the traditional markets like the Western markets, in the Middle East markets, demand remained quite stable and in fact also increased. But in Asia, particularly in Southeast Asia, we really don't see a similar consumption trend like what we saw in the Western market, like in, in, in North, America or in uh, uh, Europe, it, Southeast Asia is not, it, it has not been like that because there's still a preference for fresh fish or for frozen fish if it's available um, compared to canned tuna. Of course, supermarkets started buying more because they want to replenish uh, whatever they sold during the panic buying period and they wanted to have a, um, um, basically secure supply for the coming months while there were lockdowns going on in, in several countries. So um, other than Japan and a little bit um, rise in Australia, in other Southeast Asian market, we do not see much changes. But interestingly, um, I, I, I just noticed something that I'd like to share with you. You know, in Singapore, which is a tiny, tiny marketplace, all of a sudden they had almost 80% rise in tuna imports. That shows that uh, the, the preference or rather affluent consumer group who can spend more money, um, they are going more for canned tuna in this part of the world because it's other the other consumers which are lower income group they go for canned food like canned sardines and canned mackerel which are much much cheaper than canned tuna but not necessarily for canned uh, canned tuna now let me focus a little bit more on the uh, non canned tuna market okay this is something quite interesting, you know, compared to the global canned tuna trade, um, which kind of, kind of, uh, we see a stable uh, market trend over the years. This, this is a product group, which is non-canned tuna, which is either fresh tuna or frozen tuna, fillet or, or loins or steaks. We saw quite a good trend until last year, but that has, Kind of that has changed in, in, in 2020. And um, that, although um, frozen tuna section is relatively stable, fresh tuna imports are very much affected by uh, the cancellation of flights or almost non existence of scheduled flight between the markets or from supply side to, to the markets. Now, the largest market, Japan, for example, that is the largest non canned tuna market where they mostly buy for sashimi usage. There was almost no supply of air flown tuna during this uh, spring festival season, April, May. Uh, and markets mostly depend, 
depended that the market depend more on local supplies. Uh, the market, Japanese market, also imported quite a lot, like 23% more uh, frozen fillet, deep frozen fillet minus 60 degrees Celsius. And but because of, of the lockdown or very little uh, eating outside, um, there were a lot of stocks available in the market which affected the high, particularly the high value tuna, that is the uh, bluefin low in imports uh, that came in from the Mediterranean air region. There are stockpile in the market right now and uh, that still continues. U.S. Is also the same. Um, during this year's Lent season, demand for this kind of product was relatively less compared to last year. And the worst thing what, what we notice is the really, really negative trend for January, May. In Japan, it came down, the frozen tuna loans imports declined by 14%, USA by 8 minus 8%. Uh, Spain minus 12%, South Korea, Russia minus 24%. So most of the markets that we saw continuous growth during the last three, four years showed negative trend in 2014, sorry, in 2020, during January, May. So that is something that 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 I, I guess uh, will uh, affect the, the sales volume of this particular product group. Uh, worldwide and this is a product is not cheap um, although it is preferred in many cases compared to it, it replaces Aunque, bueno, es más barato que, que otros en el caso estadounidense está reemplazando el consumo de carne en vez del filete de, de ternera ahora está el filete de moda el filete de atún pero Ese mercado, yo creo, este año la pauta va a ser, no va a ser tan positiva como lo fue el año anterior. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias, Fatina, por darnos un panorama global sobre el comercio en el sector de atún enlatado y no enlatado. Muy interesante. A large demand during the early months of the COVID-19 outbreak. But the question is, would we be able to sustain this growth uh, post-COVID? Anyways, we will come back to that later on in the discussion, section, uh, discussion sessions after all the presentations. Just before we move on to the next um, presentation from uh, the next panelist, we have, uh, just to let everyone know, we have launched the, um, the poll questions. Uh, please feel, feel free to, uh, fill in those uh, poll questions that, I mean, that have been provided. Uh, we will now move on to the next uh, panelist, Mr. Arnab. What do you have for us from the Middle East? Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, everybody hear me? Can hear you, yes, we can hear you. Our COVID period where we are on webinar, uh, at least we are in touch with each other. So we have a couple of questions in front of me, which I'll try to reply during the conversation, as well as uh, to answer some questions as it come in. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so there we are. Webinar PowerPoint. So I'll take you through basically the Middle East business shared with Fatima and as she's from research, I would give more credibility to her. I have just taken the main uh, supplying uh, countries and done a quick uh, at them. In 2019 was something on this line uh, for us, just to give you how important they are. Uh, I have for people being from the com commercial side, I've just not showed the tonnages but I've also sold the containers that come in. So it's Saudi Arabia. This is the 19th approximately business coming in from uh, Egypt, uh, from uh, Thailand and Indonesia. These are the two main suppliers coming into uh, Saudi Arabia. 
Then you have United Arab Emirates, where there's a, quite a bit amount of cross-trading happening from UAE to other countries in Africa or to Iran, mostly from Thailand uh, business. A bit from in the Philippines come in for the local population. And then there is business suppliers of Indonesia, of course, as Qatar. Those are the containers they approximately buy. The next big one is Egypt. A uh, substantial shredded market uh, with the price increase, their exchange rate and the economic situation, that's what it has become. Libya, which is uh, traditionally a big market, has started coming in with the oil prices going up. But uh, as we'll go through, I'll give you some insights on how that market is. Iraq, and then there is Jordan. Uh, Jordan is mainly for its own consumption and a lot of business. Uh, can you send the present? Uh, yeah. I, uh, 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 the, I can uh, uh, give you an idea about that. And then uh, Jordan has its shipments going for their own consumption as well as this trade into Iran. To look at Jan to May, comparing how the countries have done. Uh, for, so for what I analyzed and came out that this had been a bit of a difference uh, from what uh, Fatima shared with us. Uh, I will just check and come back to you guys on Saudi Arabia as a market. For me, the business had uh, gone down a little bit during this COVID period over there. Uh, then there's been a significant drop in most of the markets, uh, the big one being Libya. And Libya, more than COVID, the challenge was basically the exchange rate. The petrol prices fell down. There was not much of money in that market and shipments got delayed. And then there is uh, UAE, the market grew. And that is uh, because of COVID. Uh, Canned tuna, as we have all seen, has been a perfect business uh, per to have put it in your pantry. And there was panic buying on uh, canned tuna. That and I would like to recommend people just to be careful about a bullwhip effect that might take place. Because uh, as, uh, as for UAE, I know, and in Saudi, most of the inventories which was there in the country has been offloaded. So now there is uh, demands coming in. Uh, the situation that's happened in Libya was the sharp downturn of 47% that I showed was basically because of the exchange rate. So in Libya, there's a good thing that happens is that tuna is a, a basically essential product. And therefore, the government allows letter of credit from banks at an official exchange rate, which is significantly lower than the black market exchange rate, which you would definitely have to use for buying most of the products in Libya, if it's chocolates or if it's computers or anything else. So whenever the market prices jumped up now uh, because of oil prices going uh, down, the people went back to this LC form of payment. Uh, there was a huge delay in shipments, getting the LCs in, contracts made, I'm sure with a couple of my uh, supplier friends would say has been very upset with delays that's happening there. Egypt, the second big market has seen a growth in this market. Egyptians are very smart. They have understood how the trend of tuna happens. So coming to November, December, post uh, Anuga or Sial, they usually do the contract. So fast, a lot of business coming in. Uh, again, tuna being a, a, a shelf stable product has had a good demand uh, for the COVID uh, pandemic uh, picking up, but it was mainly shredded which people wanted principalmente el trozado el conductor la gente está un poquito preocupada con el tema laboral cómo vamos a sobrevivir con los fondos limitados que vamos teniendo which would have would have reflected on the uh, Egyptian if you see uh, the the growth of business was about 25% in this uh, first quarter compared to quarter but the dollar price jump was much significantly lower and then we take another two market of Saudi Arabia and UAE, as uh, we see that this is part of the bigger businesses. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt comes in Fatima's top 10 uh, tuna trade business. Uh, there has been certain movement in Saudi Arabia during this COVID period. Uh, tuna has uh, started uh, getting a good demand and appreciation. You know, people uh, for, uh, are becoming more health conscious. Uh, so there has been a demand on that. Uh, the uh, people are very uh, are given up quite a bit of meat eating structure has moved to this thing. Uh, then also the eating habit of tuna has changed. It was generally a solid 
ये लाइट मीट टू ना बिजनेस एंड दैट हैज मूव बेसिकली टू वर्ड व्हाइट मीट बिजनेस सो पीपल आर गोइंग गोइंग अप एंड and also the solid has gone down to the chunk so there has been a movement in the segmentation of the market and that's a very interesting thing to watch out uh, there was a question i saw somebody are uh, uh, well aware of the saudi arabian business about taxation that's happening so basically with the oil price down and changes happening uh, saudi arabia which was basically a petro economy did not have any taxation a uh, couple of years back they got a 5% back and from 1st of july that has become a 15% back uh that has come in uh things are changing in saudi arabia i was just looking at an article which said that uh people it was a money transaction cash business uh, economy which is moving to card a lot of card business have started coming in but we still need to see what is the impact of this 15% vat coming in because till june uh, people were aware that this is going to be a vat so there was a lot of demand lot of storage happening uh, we need to see in july august again august was eid so there would have been some movement happening but let's see how it works out uh, the other big scary part was that the custom duty in saudi arabia had uh, could be uh, changed because many products which saudi has got some uh, demand or some production went up from 5 to 7% 7 to 14% so there were a big jumps of custom trade but for tuna they have still kept it at 5% so that's what happened in saudi arabia uh uae of course yes the stocks in the market was eliminated so it was a good time to destock the market the covid pandemic shells were getting empty both all, all in the middle east market uh as i had mentioned before let's be aware of the fact the trends have started coming in uh the fact that remains that you know tuna in most of the production companies were essential items and they were not covered in pandemic helped the supply chain uh, so there was a question on the from the Uh, from the attendees about the supply chain of tuna and i would say that uh, definitely in thai uh, thailand or in other supply chain was not majorly affected maybe a little bit here and there on the shipping and the clearance part of it uh, because it was basically a uh, uh, put in the essential food category that it came in uh, the another important thing in middle east to be remembered now is that uh, because of this changes that's happening in the oil price in the structure of economy a uh, lot of uh, the economies have a big expatriate population so in uae about 10% is local 90% of the population or maybe 85% of the population are expatriate people and we already can see a movement expectation about now 10 to 14 i was having a discussion yesterday with somebody and they were saying uh, they expecting 10 to 14% of the population moving out kuwait has made some new rules and regulation limiting uh, members coming in so there will be a change in this population and the demand movement so yeah we need to be aware of that so that's basically the quick small presentation to start off with uh, let me see if there were other questions on qna i should do uh, species of tuna you want somebody wanted to know most of the middle east market has been a uh, uh, it's 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 a skipjack market generally except for kuwait and lebanon which is a, a white meat tuna market uh, demand of canned tuna is not normal depends on due to food shortages okay that's for fatima so i think so that's where i would uh, uh, stop sharing my presentation and then we will have i think some panel questions in few minutes time thank you everybody Thank you, um, Arnab. Interesting to see uh, figures showing decline in imports of, um, of imports of canned tuna in most countries in the Middle East during the first few months of the year. Also, here you had uh, enlightened our situations in your key markets, which is uh, really interesting. Moving on the, to the EU tuna markets, Mr. Wan, the floor is yours.
Kokanagashiga, uh, thank you for this opportunity to InfoFish. Uh, 2020 Bangkok. And thank you, you for this opportunity to talk about evolution and opportunity. Uh, and my presentation is divided into several parts. Uh, the first point is about the European tuna industry and market. Uh, European Union production is the uh, more 364,000 tons. Uh, second uh, product worldwide. The, consum the consumption is uh, 758,000 tons. Uh, 21,000 direct employing special women. And the European uh, Union market, 48% uh, of the uh, European market. The marketing activity internalization, uh, 172 activity. Uh, commit with the sustainability of the tuna stocks resource. High, uh, high efficiency in the productive process. and environmental friendly friendly y por supuesto amiga del bien del medio ambiente in summary uh, with uh, quality That's guarantee uh, quality guarantee uh, food safety and trazability con la garantía de calidad la seguridad alimentaria y la fácil trazabilidad del producto uh, corporate social and responsibility Regulate and control activity. Commitment, research, development and innovation. Y a la digitalización y la automatización. Flexible, social, intelligent, flexible. sustainable. Entonces que contamos con un sistema que es flexible, eh, abierto a la sociedad, dinámico. If, uh, pro, uh, efficient production, in summary. La, producto, la, la producción eficaz, en, en, en esencia, se, reduce, se viene a... And the operator, more intellectual and creative processes. Y que se trata de crear unos procesos eh, más intelectuales, más, más elaborados y, y, y mejor formados, mejor armados. And generate uh, industry... Important socioeconomic activity, a sector with a sustainable. The European tuna uh, industry, uh, la tuna europeo, the production is around 364,000 tons. 364,000 tons. Spain, 67%. Italy, 21%. French, Portugal, 6%. Other European country, 1%. You can see uh, the European Union can a tuna export in 2019. Around 261,321 tons. Uh, the value 
one million three hundred fifty-two euros. Main destination of the European export is the United uh, European Union, Switzerland, Canada, Libya, the European Union Canetuna import in 2019, around 655,930 tons. Y the value uh, two million nine hundred sixty three euros. Main supply country Spain, Ecuador, Philippines, Morris, Seychelles. The European Canetuna consumption uh, source Euro Eurostat two thousand nineteen is the European seven Canetuna. Consumption is on average 758,000 tons. The European per capita apparent consumption of Canetuna 1.48 kilo per son year in 2019. The slide is in the European Canetuna industry, the strategic line is the first point. The first point is about the uh, research, development and innovation. Product, inno product innovation, process innovation, food automation and digitalization. Industry intelligence for industry uh, for uh, point zero. In summary, in summary, efficient production, factory with greater adaptability. And so, so point uh, environment sustainability environmental in the food chain and economy uh, circular economy iniciativas uh, amigas del medio ambiente y el desarrollo de una economía circular y sostenible son social economic environmental sabemos que tienen un ámbito social económico y medioambiental for me this importance for the tuna sector is the whole the rural modernization. A mí lo que más me 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 importa desde el punto de vista como productor es la seguridad alimentaria. Sustainable access resource. El contar con una fuente de recursos sostenible. And food safety and traceability. Así como reitero la la seguridad alimentaria y la traceabilidad. The tail safety of the food chain and all Safety, con datos precisos de la cadena alimentaria y contar con todas las garantías de seguridad de control para dichos productos. In the, in the European Union is very important. Comply es muy importante en la Unión Europea el ajustarse you, you, you fishery. a las uh, pesquerías you, you, you fishery. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, The market Hoy el, hoy por el mercado. Uh, the European tuna market. Mercado de la tun, en la tan. One of the most attractive market es worldwide. Es de los más atractivos del mundo. Big market apparent consumption 758,000 tons. Con sumo aparente es de casi 760.000 toneladas métricas. And growing market. Y es un mercado en pleno crecimiento. Canet tuna is the most consumer pro product in the European Union. Hoy el atún en lata es el producto más de mayor consumo eh, en toda la Unión Europea. A new consumption habit. Porque existen unas pautas nuevas de consumo. Health, sustainability, convenience. El consumidor tiene más uh, concienciación sobre la salud, la sostenibilidad, el recurso y la conveniencia de uso. 
and uh, growth in concert 40 environment. Y existe cada vez una preocupación mayor por el medio ambiente. In the European, in the European Canetuna market, uh, COVID-19 impact. El impacto que tuvo el COVID-19 en este mercado de la atún en lata. Is uh, increase of the Canetuna consumption. En, uh, ha, ha provocado los siguientes fenómenos. En primer lugar, un incremento. Increase of the retail channel. Al, menú, al detalle. Growth in importance of safety and health. Una mayor importancia otorgada a la seguridad y a la salud. Only uh, sales of the opportunity. Se ha presentado la oportunidad de hacer ventas online, en línea. Demand reduction in the restaurant, hotel and catering uh, catering channel. Ha habido, por supuesto, un desplome de la demanda por parte del sector de la restauración, hotelero y de la industria del catering. Cash postponement. También se ha pospuesto uh, los pagos uh, en líquido, la liquidez se, se ve afectada. Delay in the arrival of the product. Y, por supuesto, un retraso enorme en la entrega o la llegada de los productos. En mi uh, opinión, which is the future of the Euro European Union is en, en mi opinión, es el futuro de la Unión Europea pasa por la, el cierre de fronteras. Uh, more protectionism, a un, a mayor proteccionismo. Economic uncertainty. Uh, es, es, vemos la incertidumbre económica. Y tres tensión. Y se van a dar mayores tensiones de tipo comercial. The situation will cause a socioeconomic negative impact in the European Union. Y esto va a tener todo un impacto socioeconómico negativo muy importante en el ámbito de la Unión Europea. This slide show the keys for the future of the European Union industry hard. Esta diapositiva muestra un poco cuál es el futuro de la industria de la atún en lata en el contexto de la Unión Europea. Es un product sustainable ethic. Eh, donde se otorga mucha importancia a la salud y al bienestar, donde los productos son sostenibles y se obtiene de manera ética. Health and wellness. Existe, bueno, eso, ya digo, una concienciación por la salud y el bienestar. Convenience. Y es eh, muy conveniente, fácil de usar. Universal versatility. Es un producto muy versátil. Eh, multiple occasion y healthy. Es, que se puede usar en múltiples ocasiones durante todo el año. To conclude, I think the, uh, the future of our ocean and, and industry of tuna is, is start with the rich sustainability rules today. And the level playing field. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Wan, for your presentation. Uh, it is not worth it to know about um, to know about the strategies that have been applied to the EU tuna market. Uh, las estrategias que se han venido ejecutando en la Unión Europea y nos ha ilustrado sobre el impacto que ha tenido eh, el COVID-19 en la industria tunera en lata. Ah, de, 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 de la Unión Europea pasamos a Estados Unidos. Toma la palabra el ponente, el señor John Connelly. Muchas gracias. Solamente agregar unos comentarios uh, breves. No tengo una presentación por parte. El COVID ha tenido un impacto en el uh, mercado americano mucho. Lo vemos uh, hasta el día de la fecha. Vamos a hablar un poquito de las opciones para seguir evolucionando y los cambiados, cambios que han tenido lugar en los últimos meses. Desde 111% de aumento en las ventas de atún enlatado en un periodo de dos meses durante eh, las compras que se efectuaron por el pánico que mencionaba Fátima. 
en el trimestre, el atún enlatado creció 44% en el primer trimestre. Y sigue siendo, teniendo un 25% de aumento en el segundo trimestre. O sea que... En esos dos meses, we're up about 111%. Um, it did, it has maintained some of its growth and some of its uh, strength even into the second quarter when uh, some ec economic activity continued uh, or, or reopened. Overall, year to date, uh, the category is up about 30%, and largely driven by people uh, not going to the store as frequently um, and uh, shifting from eating out of home to, to eating, obviously, in home. Uh, to Cantoon in the U.S. has benefited from uh, its familiarity and uh, that there were significant problems or disruptions in beef, pork, and a bit of poultry uh, production in the North American markets. And so seafood, in, including Cantuna, became a relatively more attractive protein for people to, uh, to enjoy. So we're, we're able to take advantage of that. As far as availability, um, most of the processors were able to keep a uh, product on shelf through most of even the panic buying. Uh, there were some areas where uh, that product was short, uh, but nowhere near what we saw with the other proteins. So uh, that's a testament to, the, to a robust supply chain. Eso demuestra que tenemos una cadena de suministro muy robusta. Gracias a los procesadores, distribuidores, vendedores y otros canales en Estados Unidos. Eh, eso se mantuvo más que todo en las estanterías durante todo ese periodo. Hubo algunos cambios de canales. En algunas tiendas como en Walmart bajó un poco, pero en otros almacenes pequeños, cosas por el estilo, hubo un aumento muy grande. De la producción de, estamos hablando de lata y de bolsa. En ambos casos se vio crecimiento. Los nuevos compradores pues, sí, tienen una tendencia a ir hacia el enlatado, que es lo que conocen un poquito más en el primer trimestre. 33% aumento de las bolsas y 44% de los enlatados. Segundo trimestre sigue habiendo crecimiento. Comprado el año anterior, la bolsa del 8%. Pero la lata ya había crecido un 23%. Podemos ver entonces que. Ambos crecieron, pero la bolsa no creció tanto como el enlatado. Eso es simplemente para darles una breve, un breve resumen del mercado norteamericano para pasar a la sesión de preguntas y respuestas para seguir con nuestra conversación. Muchas gracias, John Connolly, por esta información tan interesante que nos han dado sobre el mercado de el atún en Estados Unidos. Pasemos entonces a la próxima sección de este seminario web. Vamos a pasar a las preguntas y respuestas para nuestros panelistas. Hemos preparado algunas de las preguntas para que ellos respondan. Antes de pasar a esta siguiente sección, respuesta. El señor Juan, confirmación, si van a responder a las preguntas en español o en inglés. Speak Spanish in the uh, answer the question. Voy a hablar en español cuando responda a las preguntas. Uh, Mr. Juan. Uh, could I just uh, ask you if you could just go um, go to the interpretation tab at the bottom of the screen, and can you just click on off on the on the uh, interpretation on the options? Just click off. Oof. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right. Um, Thank now you. Looking Yeah. Right. Now, looking at um, the management of global stocks, uh, with so many things that, that has been uh, occurring now, uh, regional fisheries management organizations have not and probably will not have 
the chance to meet this year. Uh, what, uh, what are the likely consequences of the pandemic on the management of the fish stocks in the areas of coverage? Maybe I'll start with uh, Mr. Arnab on, it, on this question. Well, I'm the wrong person to start with <laughs> because I'm more of, a, <laughs> of these uh, Maybe trade and sales part, but I'll give a very layman's view. Yeah. You know, right. basically, just like in any other outsider. So I think what I understood from Tuna conference is that these are long-term data analysis that you take place. And, you know, the, the looking at the stocks, it's, if you don't meet one year, but you keep to the policies that you have implemented. For me, as a personally outside guy, I feel we should be able to manage if it's only just for a year's meeting. Uh, but it's after that, if it gets much longer, then it's a different issue. So, yeah, but I might be totally wrong. So you can have John or somebody else give me a much better answer. I'm just a layman approach to it. Maybe uh, Mr. Wan can help uh, Mr. Arnab out on this uh, question. Mr. Wan, what is your opinion on this? Para el futuro del sector por lo que todas las partes interesadas deben estar firmemente pro comprometidas con la sostenibilidad de los recursos y la explotación racional de los mismos. Obviamente, ante la imposibilidad de celebración de reuniones presenciales, muchas se han aplazado. No obstante, alguna reunión ha tenido lugar por videoconferencia, pero dada la composición de las ORPs, se dificulta en gran medida el trabajo. Aun siendo conscientes de las complicaciones generadas por la pandemia, es vital que se busquen soluciones para poder garantizar la gestión sostenible de los túnidos tropicales y la adopción de medidas de gestión y control. De este modo, confiamos que las ORPs, ante esta situación actual de crisis sanitaria, continúen fomentando y apoyando la gestión sostenible y responsable de las pesquerías de túnidos, empleados para la elaboración de las conservas de atún con el fin de asegurar la disponibilidad de materia prima actual y futura. Mr. John Connolly, um, although in 2019 the ICAT or the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas called for a 40% reduction in catches of Atlantic Big Eye, it has been criticized for not moving fast enough on conservation. What are your thoughts on this? Mr. John Connolly? The microphone. The microphone. I'm the sorry, Mr. John Connolly, you have to uh, turn off our. Yeah. Well said about the importance of long-term uh, thinking by the businesses and the fisheries managers and others involved in the in the conservation and management of tuna. Uh, so whether the RFMOs meet uh, as frequently as they have in the past during the pat during the last year or going forward in the year, given COVID, uh, the commitment by fisheries managers, the businesses, and others uh, remain the same. Uh, specific to ICAT, uh, there was a. Um, there was a call for 40% reduction in the, in the Atlantic Big Eye. And that may not have been the, uh, the uh, reduction was, was interim and that disappointed some, but it also will re be reviewed uh, next year. Um, but it's also important to remember that ICAT took significant steps uh, to further protect the Big Eye in the area of FADS. So ISSF and other groups uh, worked collaboratively to help um, ensure passage of or adoption of measures where FADS would have a two month closure in all of the uh, convention area for this year and then moving to a, a three month closure for 2021. Uh, the number of FADS will be reduced um, in the next couple of years, from 500 to 300. And there was increased observer coverage um, mandated. So. Um, well, the total package might not have been, have been what people wanted. There were still some very positive things that, um, that industry, conservation groups, uh, scientists, and organizations like ISSF pushed, and we're very pleased that the managers adopted those. Adopted those. 
uh, interesting point that you had mentioned about uh, fat closure as a, 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 an element to protecting big eye stocks. Uh, speaking of fat closure, Fatima, with the fat, fat closure in place in the Western Central Pacific during July to September, what, what effects do you think we could uh, expect to see, particularly with the ongoing pandemic? Uh, uh, thanks, Afi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Yeah, well, um, in the Pacific, actually, there are um, two closure, closure say, uh, period, I would say, between July and September. One is the Central and Western Pacific fat closure, fat fishing closure, that will be effective from July for three months until September, July, August, and September. And in the Eastern Pacific, there is there will be this IATTC um, closure for the radar closure for our, uh, two months, effective from 31st of July, which means it will be August and September. So radar closure is usually partial closure, um, but fat but Western Pacific is, is something different. So um, this will, during this period, definitely production will come down. And uh, as of today, we do see some farming up of prices, ski jack prices, uh, frozen ski jack prices for canning. So uh, if demand, the current demand continues, positive demand for canned tuna, then the processors with, uh, in, in, in the region will need, definitely need raw material. So if Thais started uh, requiring more raw material, then with this low se catch season, se uh, definitely we expect some farming up in prices. Um, but it, that didn't happen last year. No, no, last year during the fat, fat closing in the Western Central Pacific, um, tuna prices, ski jack prices remain soft, but this year might be uh, different because of overall um, positive trend in canned tuna consumption, particularly in the housing sector. Perfect response to that question. Uh, I'll now move on to the next um, set of questions. Um, I will just probably direct this to the, the three gentlemen. Um, we'll start off probably with Mr. John Connolly. Uh, with this ongoing pandemic, uh, so much uncertainties, what do you think are the main drivers of growth in the tuna industry? Do you think this is uh, supply-led or de uh, demand-led or price-led? And will this scenario change after the world recovers from the pandemic? Uh, for the North American markets, uh, price and availability uh, remain the drivers for U.S. consumption of canned tuna or shelf-stable tuna. Um, so pr pr we're never going to get away that price is an important part of, of the dynamic for a consumer. Um, familiarity and availability, this is a ubiquitous product. It's available uh, every place. So uh, th those are the drivers for us. And um, Certainly during COVID, the convenience of being able to buy a product that you can keep in your pantry um, is very uh, helpful and has been helpful. And I think we've seen that uh, with the kind of growth numbers that the US market I referenced earlier. Um, but the, the trick or the, the job of the market now or the, the tuna industry now is to take the both consumers that have come back to tuna over the last six months, and those that have reintroduced themselves to tuna in the last six months, and demonstrate the versatility um, and all the various uses uh, of tuna so that we capture them um, on a long-term basis, not just during the six months of COVID or, or 12 months of COVID or, or heaven help, 18 months of COVID. Uh, we need to capture these folks as long-term users of, of tuna and people that enjoy tuna. In all variety of ways that uh, the product can be prepared. 
Um, Mr. Arnab? Yeah, okay, now that, that's something easier for me to look at. So while you were talking, I was thinking about the canned tuna, like John said, that we need to keep the consumers there. So our mm -hmm. product is basically, you could say, somewhere between a competi competition and differential different product, if you of different products. You know, there's not much of differentiation in our product. If you use the five forces analysis to look at our industry to see what are the main structure, uh, basically our buyers, uh, buyer power as well as new entrants are pretty limited. It is competition and supplier power. So basically it has to be a price led and supply managed uh, forces that would define the demand anywhere in the world. It's that's the, the industry that is there. Uh, this industry got a lot of fillip in this last few months because of the convenience of storing uh, canned food. But then again, uh, I think so it will be a very challenging a challenge in front of an industry to keep those consumers who tried tuna after a long time or bought it for a quite a significant amount because of the COVID crisis. Uh, uh, give it when market goes back to normal, unless there is innovation of taste or other conveniences that come in, uh, I would say, John, uh, there is some work to be done on that to keep that trend going on, uh, just because that's the way the industry is structured. Uh, and if you just really work on the, our porters, five forces, that's what it comes out to be. Uh, so yeah, that's what I live. It's basically price-led and uh, the supply, are, these are the only two people who have power in this industry. And I think so it goes for all markets uh, together. Great. Um, Mr. Wan, what do you have to say about the EU tuna industry? Function of the main growth driver and the core to promote the leadership in global. The European Union tuna sector seeks to increase giving through innovation both in and product development. Leading of the development of tuna product responds to the consumer demand, who is uh, looking for easy presentation to prepare and use ready-made dishes, environmental friendly and uh, healthy is a key growth factor in the tuna industry. Likewise, one of the main challenges of the tuna industry is the optimization of production process. But its automation and digitalization play a key role in addressing itself in the concert industry for point zero. In this way, through the management of big data obtaining in the production process and obtaining value from them. It is possible to maximize the efficiency of this process and find a problem opportunity. On, on the other hand, It is also a key factor of the competitiveness of our industry have to tuna raw material and sure in which all the stockholders have the responsibility to help to promote sustainable Supply of tropical tuna species showed, showed that future generations can enjoy this. It's for me, me, my opinion. Thank you so much, Mr. Juan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Arnab and Mr. John Connolly. Fatima. Uh, maybe we could also like to hear your views, perhaps in Asia. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, what, are, what do you think are the main drivers of growth in the tuna industry in the Asia region? 
Um, thanks, Api. Well, as I mentioned earlier, in the East Asian markets, particularly in Malaysia, um, which is the largest importer in the region, um, and also uh, in Singapore, in Taiwan, in other smaller markets. Uh, import demand has been, yeah, it has gone up slightly, but the actual consumer demand from the household um, still remains strong for fresh and frozen seafood and less for canned tuna. Because people are confined at home and most people have extra time for home cooking. So they like to, to prepare something, not necessarily canned tuna based product, but something different. But at the same time, we do see some very sharp rise in, in import, meaning that um, consumption has gone up in Singapore, in Taiwan during the period. So where people have the, their per capita income is much higher compared to the other Southeast Asian nations. That shows that it's considered not, it's not like North America that is considered as a part of the normal food basket every day, but it's more kind of a fancy product. People eat tuna sandwiches in the restaurant. So when restaurants are not really open or people are not going out um, much to the restaurant during lunchtime, even if they have gone back to work, uh, demand for this kind of products or other usage in the food service sector is less compared to the normal time. And uh, I don't see really much impact um, on Southeast Asian consumer. Um, yeah, okay, th they will keep it as a self-stable product, but it's not like North America or Europe. It's different here in this part of the world. Oh, now, um, what do you, what would you say has been the greatest challenge thus far faced by the industry amidst this COVID-19 pandemic? I um, mean, how well do you think that tuna producers or processors have adapted to these challenges? Uh, we'll start off with Arnab on this question. Okay. So let's look into, if you want to break in tuna into two categories, the fresh and the horeca segment, I'll call it, uh, and then the canned tuna segment. Uh, understood from everywhere in the globe it's been a big boom for us the it was a very versatile products for the pantry and the shelves and being an essential commodity most of the countries which was producing canned tuna did not get affected by the ban so the productions was there there was not much of supply constraints that came in uh, you know a, apart from that sudden suddenness of a surge of demand which people did manage pretty well. Uh, and some shipment delays could have happened on documentation issues, which we sorted it out in a couple of weeks. I think so there was a much more bigger impact on the Horeca sector, the hotels and catering as Fatima was just mentioning, uh, because I am aware talking to a few of my colleagues and this thing that there were these Oman, Oman producers in, in my territory where I work, uh, know much about a uh, lot of artisan uh, yellowfin tuna and which used to go to the European fresh food uh, uh, horeca sectors, the demand just collapsed. They had huge inventory. Uh, the, uh, you know, so that has made a big, big challenge. And I think uh, the way we need to work out somehow to manage that demand of fresh or frozen fish into the consumers, which are not going to the hotel and restaurant chains at the moment. And I think so there are certain work that could be done on that segment like pre-packed tuna, you know, how to apply to the consumers because what I have analyzed and found out the reason people don't want to cook fish in their own house, maybe for me, what, what come forward is smell of and the trouble of cleaning and dressing the fish. If those could be addressed and worked on, then this demand could be motivated, initiated a bit earlier than getting the restaurant activated. So these are my two concerns about the supply chain. Perfect. Um, Mr. Wan, what is your opinion on this? What, has, uh, what would you say has been the greatest challenge in the, by the, faced by the EU tuna industry during this COVID-19 pandemic? 
the COVID-19 crisis is supposing several challenge for the tuna industry, which during um, this period has continued to work in order to provide the market with an essential product in the consumers, shopping baskets, such as a can of tuna. To do this, the tuna industry has had to face certain use, reforcing health, hygienic and food safety conditions in factory, ensuring its raw material supply and facing log logistical and transportation difficulty that the restriction impose in some in some country. To do this, the European tuna industry has been able to adapt by carrying out measures of safety, hygienic and health of workers. The, the European tuna company have used all the means at its disposal to guarantee the prevention and safety at war in their teams and even reorganizing the industrial activity inside the factory, applying the co recommendation of the health authority and in constant communication with them. In this way, digitization of automation, key aspect for the European tuna industry have been essential in order to respond to market demand and use, uh, answer supply. Regarding the raw material supply, and due to the worldwide situation by COVID-19, there were certain delays or logical problem, problems, but uh, there was no shortage of the tuna raw material, material, other necessary raw material. However, due to the uncertainty that can continue, it is necessary to be vigilant and avoid the tuna shortage situation. Furthermore, lockdown, restrict movement and economic uncertainty are influencing consumers, avid co causing a cha change in general purchase behavior. COVID-19 is accelerate the trend of sustainability, convenience, practicality, and also uh, agreed search, search for safety and health. Mr. John Connolly, what do you have to say about uh, uh, what are the greatest challenge that is being faced in the U.S. tuna industry? I've, I've mentioned um, uh, the first is, uh, as Juan Manuel just said, uh, keeping the product on the shelf. Uh, certainly, we have seen a run up, uh, a very significant run up in purchasing that weren't just in two months of uh, panic buying, but they were actually, it has continued through uh, the next four months also. So the keeping the product on the shelf at the retailer or, or club store, et cetera, is important. Um, I, I thought that was a very good question in the Q&A about uh, pointing out that some of the inventory that fed uh, the system over the last couple of months um, actually resulted from product that was put up or, or packed in 2019. And I think it's important that the tuna industry look at uh, some of the issues occurring in the broader seafood industry, in the broader protein industry, as far as food workers in their comfort level to get back into the plants and pack up the product um, that was caught in 2020. So we are we're interested, uh, we're not yet concerned, but we're interested in monitoring what's occurring in the production areas as far as COVID, because we need to make sure those workers are very confident in getting back into their manufacturing plants and packing plants so that we have product um, into the fall and into the winter of, of 2020. And then lastly, we are aggressively monitoring and communicating uh, questions about the safety of food, um, seafood specifically, and in this case, tuna specifically, um, that any question that, there should be no question that COVID is not transmitted through tuna at all. It is not transmitted through tuna packaging at all. And this is a respiratory illness in every academic in the area of public health, every um, agency in the area of public health, and FAO and the World Health Organization have all been adamant 
that you cannot get COVID from, um, from tuna, you can't get it from shrimp, you can't get it from salmon, you can't get it from food in general. Um, but there continue to be stories on the internet, and even some governments are beginning to test product for COVID when that's frankly a waste of resources. So long term, we're concerned about some of the misimpression about how you catch COVID and when it, whether it can be done through food. So three areas, keeping the product on the shelf, keeping the production worker um, in the plant, and third, the misimpression uh, or eliminating any impression that uh, tuna is some kind of vector for, for transmission of COVID. Thank you, uh, Mr. John Connolly, for those interesting points. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Um, according to FAO report, addressing COVID-19 impacts and structural crisis in the Pacific, the estimated cost of the COVID-19 pandemic to fishing companies is around $50,000 uh, $50, to $60,000 per day per tuna vessel, and island nations $130,000 per day per vessel in lost revenues. Now, how have businesses and governments responded to the severe loss of revenue? In your opinion, will there be a change, major changes in the fishery sector in island nations in the aftermath of the pandemic? Uh, I'll probably direct throw this question off to um, Arnab and Mr. Wan. Arnab. Uh, okay, so uh, again, this is, see, we are in a crisis situation. And again, I'm not an expert in the fisheries, fishing business, uh, though I would love to learn and be there a bit more. Uh, but it's going to be a, a time now that we have to support each other there would be uh, issues of cash flow, uh, protection of cash flow that's coming in. And that's a lot of each of these uh, countries or the boats are losing out. And I'm very sure that the fishing nations would take the measures to be resilient because it's an, it's an important source of income that got affected. And that... And point of view, I expect some uh, resilience, some issues being brought up by the fishing nation because of this revenue disruption. And, uh, and, and we need to understand as an industry because that's the source of our raw material and to see how we can support it. But I do not have or I'm not equipped or handled uh, or have expertise to talk about what are the options and how can we handle it. Mr. Wan. Well, the, the European Maritime and Fishery Fund, the EFF, has developed a specific measures to mitigate the COVID-19 impact in the fishery and aquaculture sector. In this way, measures have been developed to compensate the economic losses derived from the COVID-19 for the fishing, aquaculture, processing and marketing operator from several regions. On the other hand, the European Union member state, in order to minimize the impact on the economic and facility a rapid recovery, have made available economic and social measures such as financing lines of guarantee. guarantee. Now, um, Fatima, um, based on your work experience, in the Asia Pacific. What do you think could work in the Pacific on this? Sorry, yeah. Um, I, I'm not an expert on this field, uh, not definitely on fishing. Uh, as one said that there will be support from the European Union for the fisheries, uh, which are handled by, for example, Spain, France, they are fishing nations and they are, they are, they are fishing fleets are fishing in the Indian Ocean as well as in the Pacific. Um, so some, this kind of support definitely it's going to help, uh, help uh, the, the fishing companies. Uh, 
but as far as uh, uh, price is concerned, I'm meaning that if for some reason tuna price comes down and and it doesn't give much benefit to the fishing uh, for to the fisheries or to the fishermen, uh, then that will be a concern. Then another thing is rising price of fuel. Now it looks like that fuel price is going up slightly. It might also impact or we have to monitor um, that uh, if fuel price goes up considerably, it will impact the prices of uh, or the cost of uh, fishing tuna in, in every ocean whatsoever. The other thing is the impact of COVID. This is something that we haven't really discussed. Uh, I just want to highlight something that because of the of COVID-19 and in some cases the crews are affected, uh, we, we would, uh, whether we, what kind of impact we will see on a de rather delay in, in fishing. For example, in the Indian Ocean side in Seychelles, when the crew came from Spain to, to for, for a shifting of, uh, of, of batches, they came in July and some, and some of them were, uh, were uh, detected to, have been, to be affected by COVID. And the whole batch of 200 over crew, they were on quarantine for 40 days. Uh, so this, this, and then, then definitely there are delays in starting the fishing days in that region. And that will delay um, or rather restrict supplies of uh, regular supplies of fisheries from particularly for transshipment from the Indian Ocean to the other part of the world. So these are the factors that we need to, to look at. Um, besides the rising cost of fishing for for other reasons affected by COVID. Now, um, let's look at the, the, the fresh tuna market. Um, what about the fresh tuna market? Uh, there's been uh, disruptions in supply and consumption channels. Uh, prices have dropped. Uh, take, for example, uh, Japan. Prices, uh, prices have dropped and people are eating sushi at home. There's also significant problems for suppliers and fishing vessels to send their tuna to Japan you know, because of uh, uh, transportation difficulties and the fact that fishermen have to undergo 14-day quarantine period. How, how has the, the pandemic affected the domestic and international trade in fresh tuna for sushi and sashimi outlets? Will the fresh tuna market recover post-COVID or has it lost even more ground to the to the shelf stable products? We'll start off with Fatima on this. Yeah, interesting question. Um, <clears throat> you see, uh, the regular flights that normally brings in fresh tuna to different markets, whether it's Japan or whether it's USA or the European Union, that has been de definitely disrupted. Uh, because flights still they have not started flying in regularly and even if they do the frequencies will be less meaning that cost of air freighted tuna will be higher number one number two the fresh tuna usually taken in in the uh, in japan for example mostly in in the sashimi sushi trade where the restaurant trade plays a very important role and that sector is still still going slow very very slow meaning the consumption pattern of fresh tuna will will be different from now onwards for a while there will be less supply um, yeah, you, you say that the price is going down. Price is going down in the domestic market or in the marketplace. But the actual price will be higher because of transportation cost uh, problems in sending the fish to the market. So we do see some movement or other shifting to the frozen product, particularly ready to cook or ready to prepare where frozen fillet, frozen steaks, 
it's already getting it, it was getting uh, popularity uh, until last year but um, again the food service sector plays an important role also for frozen product that is affected you mentioned that people are eating sushi and sashimi at home i, I very much doubt even in japan uh, you know now that right now summer months is coming at that time this is the time where they do not eat much raw fish they go more for cooked product um, so they might get more into frozen product so the de the household demand for frozen tuna we might see some appreciation in the japanese market but in the other markets like in usa it's considered as an expensive product per pound of fresh thawed uh, steak is about not less than 10 us dollar per pound you know? so it is is quite expensive compared to other products so considering the uh, rising unemployment rate and uh, declining uh, disposable income of consumers um, this market section segment will also be affected in the long run and not to say about the food service sector definitely all the japanese restaurants are almost closed or operating at a very very low scale um, it will it will we will see how it is going to be in the long run but uh, doesn't look so good at least for the time being thank you for Tima, for that uh, response uh, now we've seen uh, tuna raw material prices fluctuating and in the recent month prices have dived with good catches although demand has been slow um, what do you think is the factor that is contributing more to keeping the prices lower? Is it fuel prices, higher prices, or lower demand? Uh, I'll start off with Arnab on this. I think the prices of fish has started moving up because that's what I am getting from my fellow friends in Thailand uh, when they started quoting. Uh, so basically, as we look into this industry, it's the supply suppliers that have a lot of power. So supply does make a big difference. And I think catching has been not so good in the last few weeks, but I have better experts uh, who one can tell, uh, give us a better approach on what the things are happening. So of course, price is a demand and supply question. It's a huge uh, stock building up before, then the canned tuna's demand picked up, and, and which is majority of the tuna business that we're looking at. And now the supply of canned tuna has gone down. Uh, you know, the boats did go out in the beginning because, you know, we thought that if you are in the sea, you don't get cold. Very depressed. So people did not know how to measure what's happening. And uh, then now the prices are picking up. So let's see how catching takes place. And then we would know how uh, the price movement happens. So, of course, for me, it's the volume of catching that defines the supply is the main thing followed by the demand that determines the price point. Mr. Wan, do you have uh, any other um, points that you would like to raise? Sí, yo creo que el segmento del, del atún fresco en el mercado en todo el mundo, yo creo que hubo un crecimiento estable en el 2019, ¿no? Desafortunadamente, eh, este crecimiento comenzó a detenerse desde enero de 2020, debido a la pandemia del COVID-19, y en abril 20 de 2020 las ventas, eh, como todos sabemos, en restaurantes y el sector de la hostelería, se desplomaron un 80% en todo el mundo, ¿no? ya que en muchos países se prohíbe comer en el interior por parte de las restricciones. ¿no? Por tanto, el abastecimiento de materia prima atún es un factor crítico en el sector. ¿no? Esto se debe a que el atún es un pescado salvaje, que debe capturarse con respecto a sus ciclos de reproducción, y hoy en día la demanda mundial es mayor frente a un esfuerzo pesquero sostenible. ¿no? Como consecuencia, afecta al precio del atún y al coste del atún. Y, y esto es lo que yo tengo que decir sobre esto. ¿no? Uh, Mr. John Connolly. I, I don't think I could add anything to what okay. was said okay. um, on that. All right. Um, moving on to um, adapting to consumer needs. Looking at uh, canned tuna consumption, 
Uh, I think most of uh, you in your presentation, you had mentioned that canned tuna consumption has gone, has gone up significantly, significantly during the lockdown movement restriction periods. Uh, a recent news indicated that tuna demand is so strong it beat the losing streak experienced by other seafoods like lobster, whose prices dropped after restaurants began closing down due, due to the coronavirus. Now, would you see this as a flash in the pan or is it something that is likely to stay on longer? And how would you sustain this canned tuna growth post-COVID? Uh, we'll start off with Fatima on this question. Well, as, as, as I, we mentioned earlier, that the retail sales of canned tuna increased you know, significantly during March, April in the Western market. But then it detained, returned to normal by May or late April and May. Uh, that indicated uh, less than large consumption at household as households had time to prepare more meals at home. And canned tuna is not considered a complicated product group for which, uh, uh, for, uh, and it, which is popular in the restaurant. So canned tuna is considered a more affordable product at home in the Western markets. And in restaurant, compared to crustaceans such as shrimp, crab, and lobster, it's definitely affordable. So, um, in 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 the in the traditional Western markets, or even in Australia or in New Zealand, I think it will continue to uh, to be a, a product that is in in consumers' shopping list. But in East Asian markets, uh, I think people will will just keep it in case we don't have anything to cook at home, then we'll keep it not on a regular basis. So well, it's the same thing that I mentioned earlier. That that trend, I, I think it's going to continue uh, for the time being because here uh, it is, it is uh, uh, in this part of the world, Fresh and frozen seafood is still considered, and also other other protein like chicken, still considered uh, uh, to be common in 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 the daily household shopping bar, shopping list uh, rather than canned tuna. Um, yeah, Fatima, uh, maybe I probably uh, um, come back to you. I'll probably I'll go back to your response. Uh, you had mentioned that retail sales of canned tuna has increased. Now, as you know, worldwide economy is declined. Do you foresee that consumers are up, is going to, uh, will be buying basic canned tuna packs instead of the fancy and the pricier pack styles? Well, I think John is in a better position and also one to, to respond to that because they are directly linked. Um, but we must, from from general, from from uh, I mean, looking at at at, uh, at the normal trend, fancy product, for example, in in the North uh, American market, it's expensive than the conventional tuna cans. Fancy product meaning you are talking about tuna in pouch, right? Or or in other items like tuna in cups. Those are convenient products are a little bit expensive compared to tuna in can. So I think John can uh, shed some light on that. And also, I I would I would also request one to to say a few words for the same thing for the European Union market too. All right. Now we'll move on to uh, move on to John. In the European demand. Entendemos que la demanda mundial del atún en conserva se mantuvo fuerte en todo el mundo durante el primer trimestre del, del 2020, ¿no? De 2020. Ya que, lo, yo, que consideramos que los consumidores, particularmente en el mercado occidental y de Oriente Medio, continuaron comprando y almacenando conservas durante la pandemia y en vista a las restricciones que se imponían en los diferentes mercados, ¿no? Eh, centrándonos en Europa, el mercado de las conservas de atún, la Unión Europea es un mercado en ligero crecimiento, con un consumo aparente medio de 758.000 toneladas, 
y con un consumo aparente per cápita de 1,48 kilos habitante año de conservas de atún. ¿no? En este contexto, yo diría que durante el primer cuatrimestre del 2020, la demanda de los hogares de conservas de atún aumentó en toda Europa, ¿no? particularmente en los países donde se impusieron las medidas más restrictivas, como fue España, Italia, Portugal, Francia y Alemania. ¿no? En España, por ejemplo, la compra de conservas de atún experimentó un incremento del 82% durante la semana 11 del año, semana que concluye con la declaración del estado de alarma ¿no? y se situaron con, como el top 10 de los principales productos adquiridos por los hogares españoles durante esa semana. ¿no? Eh, tras, después, eh, tras un periodo de estabilización en la compra, se volvieron a observar incrementos durante la semana del estado de alarma, incremento que como media se situaron por encima del 20%. En Italia, entre enero y mayo, las ventas de atún en conserva se incrementaron aproximadamente un 26%. Y en Portugal se incrementaron las ventas de conservas de atún en marzo con un pico de consumo entre eh, 130 a 140%. ¿no? Y en abril-mayo hubo una desaceleración, sin embargo, eh, en junio las ventas volvieron a, a, a su senda habitual. ¿no? O sea que en el momento actual estamos en la senda habitual de todos los años. ¿no? De este modo, eh, yo pienso que los datos de consumo confirman un importante crecimiento de la demanda de atún en conserva por parte del consumidor europeo, ¿no? que lo considera un producto seguro, saludable, sabroso, práctico y conveniente, ¿no? y, conveniente. y además salvaje, ¿no? eh, una proteína salvaje muy importante ¿no? eh, para todos los consumidores. Eh, cabe destacar las ventas con respecto a los canales, ¿no? El retail, las ventas de conservas de atún en el canal de la distribución ha crecido mientras que el canal Oreca se ha visto afectado negativamente debido al cierre de restaurantes, hoteles y el catering. ¿no? El canal Gourmet se ha visto también afectado y en definitiva en este año eh, 2020 y a pesar de la pandemia del COVID-19 eh, se prevé que el mercado de las conservas de atún de la Unión Europea tenga una evolución estable con una tendencia positiva en cuanto a su consumo, permitiendo una valoración optimista. Mr. John Connolly, uh, maybe you would like to add some more points on this? Mr. John Connolly. Yes, um, maybe specifically to the to the second question that you asked, uh, Fatima, yeah, yeah, yeah. about the uh, difference between uh, kind of fancy fancy yeah. tuna and traditional tuna. Um, as I mentioned, uh, both pouch uh, and let's call that the, the fancy or flavored or tuna had about a 33% gain the first quarter of the year, and it's still up about 8% from uh, last year. Uh, but canned, which would typically be less expensive, it is less expensive than pouch, is up 44% um, first quarter and about 23 to 25% in the second quarter. So both experienced gains, but people are moving um, either for cost reasons that Fatima mentioned um, or familiarity reasons they are moving toward the can um, at a greater rate than they move to pouch, although both earned significant increases um, over, the last, over the first six months of 2019. And I don't think it's a surprise why, uh, not to make light of it, but in a way canned tuna or shelf-stable tuna benefited from, from the economic lockdown, that when people could not go out to eat, they needed to find things to eat out of the home They needed to find things that uh, were convenient, were versatile, uh, were familiar, um, could be stored for longer periods of time than some fresh fish, and canned tuna fits that. I do think going forward, though, it's the industry's uh, challenge to make sure that people don't view tuna as just a tuna sandwich with some mayonnaise and, and celery in there, that there are so many different ways to use this product 
in the job of the industry is to communicate that and convince consumers that uh, what they've experienced over the last six months is something that they can enjoy well into the future. Thanks, John, for your response on that. Um, Arnab, um, apart from the staple item of canned tuna, what, what do you think uh, are other forms of tuna that can be produced to capture a greater share of the expanding market for convenient eat at home foods? Okay, so basically, I'll just refer back to this uh, John statement that we should allow people to treat, uh, get, to know that there is other forms of tuna. And I think we missed a big opportunity at this point of time uh, of the more flavored and other varieties of tuna that is available uh, from this pandemic. The reference I would like to bring in is like, in, especially in Middle East, e-commerce, you know, people had some resistance has happened due to pin, uh, pandemic. A lot of who were not doing e-commerce find the opportunity for people to try out other things than canned tuna, salad tuna, or tuna in sauces. And I don't think so. We were ready. It was a good sampling, sampling thing that was possible. The other question that, that you asked me about, the other form of tuna, and as we move to the high value tuna of getting frozen tuna into the market uh, you know if it's very dressed marinated uh, you know now you have it in a portion packed in supply chain which you can just smear eat uh, cook together and the family and that could be something that i would really like or would uh, think well, we have a good opportunity now that people are homebound and i think this going back to restaurant might take some time looking at uh, the second waves that are coming up uh, in this market that that could be something that we can really upstream the frozen tuna ready to cook cleaned uh, or potential for consumers to use. Thank you Arnab. Arnab. Um, Mr. Wan, do you have any uh, opinion on this? Yo creo que la, la industria tunera de la Unión Europea trabaja eh, día a día para ensaltar la imagen de la conserva de atún y su posicionamiento en el mercado, evitando que se categorice co solo como un producto commodity. ¿no? Yo creo que eso lo que significa es que eh, quiere, se quiere generar valor y emociones eh, en nuestros productos a través de la innovación y una comunicación adecuada por esos magníficos factores. Eh, factores que tiene el atún eh, y, y atributos que permitirá construir un sector competitivo bajo un paraguas de desarrollo sostenible. ¿no? Eh, yo eh, mencionaría igualmente que la industria tunera de la Unión Europea trabaja en la elaboración de nuevas conservas de atún con nuevos sabores, nuevas presentaciones y formatos orientados a diversificar aún más la gama de productos. ¿no? No obstante, desde mi punto de vista, es destacable la tendencia, al igual que en otros ámbitos de la alimentación, hacia el lanzamiento de productos alineados con las nuevas demandas del consumidor actual, ¿no? especialmente, diría, en lo referido a productos saludables, de conveniencia, fáciles de preparar y consumir, platos preparados. Así es cada vez más frecuente encontrar en los lineales nuevos desarrollos más fáciles de preparar y consumir, así como más bajos en grasa, en sal, entre otros atributos de salud. ¿no? Eh, cada vez tenemos menos tiempo para dedicarle a estos menesteres y realmente bueno, pues se necesita cosas rápidas para preparar y, de, eh, y que el consumidor pues, se haga con este producto. ¿no? Gracias, Mr. Juan. Um, looking at um, online retail, um, as you all know that um, online um, online purchasing has been a new norm uh, for for many people in terms of uh, purchasing seafoods. How is the tuna marketing sector adapting to this trend? I will open up this uh, question to any of the panelists that would like to answer this question. Maybe I'll start with John Connolly first. La Unión Europea en estos momentos el canal online es un canal de expansión y por tanto presenta una oportunidad de crecimiento para la industria tunera. ¿no? 
eh, aún pequeño, pero eh, en expansión, que mantiene una tendencia positiva en cuanto a su presencia en el mismo, sin embargo, todavía es muy, por, está muy por detrás de otras categorías de alimentación en los canales de, de distribución. ¿no? Mr. Connolly, would you like to add anything? Uh, yeah, I, I apologize. I could not hear your question. If you could repeat okay. it. Okay. Uh, just to repeat my question, online retail is fast becoming a preferred purchase pattern. How is the tuna marketing sector uh, in the U.S. adapting to this trend? Okay. I got the adapting to this trend, but what's the trend we're talking about? <laughs> I apologize. Okay, uh, sorry. Can you hear me in, uh, correctly? Much better. Thank you. Yes, okay. much better. Online retail, uh, I'm just talking about online retail. Eh? Online retail is fast becoming a preferred purchase pattern for seafood. How is the tuna marketing sector in the U.S. adapting to this trend? Uh, um, obviously, tuna is, a, is ideal for the e-commerce or online or mixed online, offline uh, kind of growth that we've seen in the US market and other markets. Um, it's, it's transported easily, it's um, easily stored in store, um, it's easily um, stored in, in any kind of delivery vehicle, uh, large or small, that goes to a home. So we are seeing significant growth in e-commerce um, and the kind of mix of in-store and online uh, shopping for most of the major, major retailers. So, Um, we think this is a huge opportunity for in the U.S. market. Uh, Mr. Arnab? Yeah. On online? Yeah, online retail. So basically in the Middle East, online retail is picking up and due to COVID, it has really jumped up. And, I, and as John said, it's a perfect canned tuna is a perfect example. It's a shelf-stable product. It's uh, this thing and it's... Um, It is ready fixed for the online business. So we don't have to do anything special. These, the products, the way it's marketed, the stores, the online retails are putting in, the distributors are pushing it through. So it's not a big concept to bring in. I think so if we were doing frozen uh, fish tuna in this retail, then that we could have some challenges and queries on the supply chain and the interest on the consumer that we need to work on as an industry or as a, a company a business together. Now, look, looking at um, misconception of COVID-19 spreading through tuna and seafood, uh, I think uh, Mr. John Connolly had mentioned this earlier uh, in one of his responses. Uh, Mr. Wan, what are your thoughts on this and how can the industry and consumers work together to address this misconception? Yo creo que, como se ha mencionado anteriormente, los datos de consumo de conservas de atún en la Unión Europea confirman eh, un importante crecimiento en la demanda por parte del consumidor europeo, ¿no? que lo considera un producto seguro y saludable. ¿no? En este sentido, yo diría que cabe mencionar que todas las conservas de atún de la industria atunera de la Unión Europea que llegan al mercado lo hacen en condiciones de higiene industrial y seguridad alimentaria, cumpliendo lo que son los estándares legales y demás requisitos impuestos a razón de la pandemia del COVID-19. ¿no? Eh, en algunos casos se ha generado preocupación entre los consumidores por el posible contagio del COVID a través de los alimentos, pero de acuerdo con las administraciones y organizaciones mundiales sanitarias no existe ninguna evidencia al respecto, ¿no? que esto es muy importante reseñar. ¿no? Asimismo, eh, tengo que decir que la Comisión Europea, a través de la Dirección General de Sanidad y Salud Pública, ha manifestado que las condiciones de conservación del COVID-19 en superficies plásticas, acartonadas o metálicas, dependen de variables relacionadas con la temperatura y la humedad relativa, no existiendo, y esto quiero eh, recalcar, no existiendo evidencias de que pueda mantenerse activo cuando tales superficies han sido expuestas a diferentes condiciones ambientales y de temperatura. Por lo tanto, yo creo que el consumidor, eh, de este modo, eh, 
y al objeto de no dañar la imagen de la industria tunera mundial y por ende de los puestos de trabajo de la misma, todos, administración, organizaciones, sector, debemos transmitir y comunicar que las conservas de atún son un producto alimenticio totalmente seguro. ¿no? Um, our lab, uh, do you think that the importance or role of sustainability has been uh, or will be affected? I don't think so, as from a consumer, sustainability is a much long-term view, you know, and I don't think so uh, that should be impacted by COVID coming in. Um, best uh, business of, uh, to the doubt we can give is just a very slight possibility to make some quick monies because of the constraint. Some traders would be flexible or there could be some pressure in a very short-term period uh, because of supply chain to you know, overlook certain steps, but on a long term or on a real hardcore thing on sustainability, no, I don't think so. There will be any impact of COVID on that. It will continue. It's a long term view. It's a mindset. It's a value of people, and people do feel for the planet. And I think so. Uh, that 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 is independent. Um, Mr. One, do you have any um, uh, comments on this? Yo creo que en cuanto al impacto del COVID-19 en la sostenibilidad, entendida desde el punto de vista medioambiental, social y económica, eh, ha tenido un cierto impacto. Sin embargo, la industria tunera en general, tanto la flota como la, la industria transformadora eh, de la Unión Europea, ha sabido adaptarse a dicha situación. ¿no? Desde el punto de vista medioambiental, la industria tunera de la Unión Europea está fuertemente convencida que la sostenibilidad de los recursos atuneros es una tarea de todos, ¿no? esencial para disponer de una fuente de suministro estable eh, a largo plazo, como garantía de competitividad de la industria presente y futura. Eh, si bien eh, entiendo que este aspecto ha salido reforzado no solo desde el punto de vista empresarial, tanto ya digo para la flota como para la industria, sino desde el punto de vista del consumidor, ¿no? eh, aspecto clave en la decisión de compra. ¿no? Eh, esto es esencial para asegurar que el consumidor se fidelice a una marca o a una compañía porque estamos hablándole a un consumidor cada vez que tiene mayor conocimiento, más conocedor, curioso y responsable. ¿no? Por lo tanto, yo creo que la sostenibilidad es un elemento de confianza y seguridad que no se puede obviar en estos tiempos de pandemia, de COVID-19, etc. ¿no? Por otra parte, en cuanto al impacto socioeconómico en la industria tunera de la Unión Europea, esta ha sabido enfrentarse a las adversidades gracias al incremento del consumo manteniendo el empleo en más de 21.000 trabajadores directos. ¿no? Por lo tanto, la sostenibilidad no es una meta que podamos alcanzar, sino un camino, entiendo, en el que siempre será posible mejorar en los aspectos medioambientales, sociales y económicos, relativos a toda la actividad humana que surge en torno del atún, que es un producto global, ¿no? Mr. Connolly. Uh, Mr. Connolly, do you think that the importance role of uh, sustainability... Uh, just briefly, uh, obviously sustainability remains an important business issue uh, along the full supply chain, whether it be those uh, at sea right now harvesting the tuna, those packing the tuna, um, or uh, those marketing the tuna in different uh, different regions of the world. Um, we will not have our businesses unless we uh, ensure the long-term viability of, of the resource. And uh, as, again, Juan Manuel said, that uh, should be reflected in the uh, environmental, economic, and social aspects of the work that we do. In, in groups like ISSF and others um, are working in those areas. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Still on this uh, question on sustainability, uh, sustainability, um, Fatima, do you think do you think that there should be a premium on the selling price of tuna, which carries assurance of sustainability? Um, well, I think there already is. Uh, premium price on that because certification 
costs a lot and some consumers are ready to pay premium price for sustainable products and uh, i think juan and john and also arnab would be able to say more about that because they are directly linked with the market uh, mr arnab do you have any uh, response to that question okay uh, uh, this you are you're fading away if you would i'll just rephrase your question that you think that are people paying an upcharge for sustainable products during the covid period right yeah right that's right okay yeah, so covid or covid or otherwise also otherwise yeah otherwise you know, especially in the market where i work or know about middle east sustainability is just starting to come in so it's not a rule it's not a regulation but there is some noise about thoughts about it uh but during this covid period where there was you know no product on the shelf if a consumer would give away a normal tuna and stand for sustainable tuna only i don't think so you know people would first take care of themselves so they would buy a tuna if there was no option for sustainable even or disposable income in people's uh, hands are less because of they're going on full long or losing jobs uh maybe the price difference could be a pinching point in the decision making should remains on the consumer's part but whatever said and done it'll be a very short term thing and once uh, the covid is things and things go back to knowledge as juan had mentioned it's a mindset it's a lifestyle choice and we need to move into this uh, uh, into a sustainability proposal and then the business could come in so that's my thoughts and a very personal thought of mine um we'll move on to the next question i i think we have uh, we are still on time right uh looking at um market predictions usually market predictions will look at several link factors such as production disease market demand and trade barriers but this year many prior prior predictions made at the beginning of this year have had to be thrown out as the world grapples with the coronavirus pandemic which has disrupted the supply chain from end to end what are your thoughts on this mr wan I think uh, undoubtedly to the coronavirus impact must be added to the prediction made in the beginning of uh, the year, such as the trade relation, rela relation between the USA, European Union, Ch China, and Brexit. Therefore, is uh, obviously affect the worldwide tuna market, raw material supply. No, our sector. start 2020 with sustainable growth despite the international situation uh, now it has to face one more challenge that is necessary to reinforce such as the need to consolidate a strong industrial base in the european union with allow is it to supply its market ensure the maximum warranty of quality and food safety mr john connolly yeah, i just do want to go back i mean uh, to just the previous question from mobile okay. yeah right um <clears throat> excuse me uh as far as sustainability and uh, the the pricing Tuna remains a very competitive product, um, and price will always be important to the consumer. And so, adding uh, costs uh, to the product are uh, becomes a challenge when we're facing competing proteins. Um, but it's uh, we feel strongly that sustainability is driven by fisheries managers um, and those in government that ultimately we, we ask to make these decisions. So that's why it's so important that collaborative efforts like ISSF uh, be supported. and be successful in their efforts to to work with others to ensure the, the long-term sustainability of the product. Um specific to COVID um 
obviously every it, every forecast in every industry, whether it be uh, retail, manufacturing, food, um, et cetera, was wrong uh, because no one forecast COVID was going to occur when we when we started the year. And we're, I think the companies that we work with are looking is who can adapt to this change most quickly? Um, how will they look at this uh, in six months or 12 months time? And what changes have they made uh, to their product, uh, to their supply system, to their supply chain, um, in how they deal with their customers at the retail or food service level? So we're we're interested in look, in helping them understand the changes that uh, consumers are demanding as a result of COVID, and the successful tuna companies will be those that adapt and innovate uh, quickly, uh, much like other sectors of the economy have had to do. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. John Connolly. Uh, we will take uh, a few questions from the participants. And I have a question here for Mr. Mr. Wan. Uh, Mr. Wan, in your presentation, you predict, uh, predicted that the EU may impose trade barriers against tuna products as a form of protect, uh, protectionism. However, we read that the EU and Vietnam will sign the trade free agreement in August, where tariffs on fresh and frozen Vietnamese tuna products into the EU will be eliminated. Do you foresee more overseas suppliers seeking to set up similar agreements with the EU with regards to canned tuna? And will this new trade agreement with Vietnam affect sales of Ecuadorian canned tuna to the EU? Bueno, en mi opinión, yo creo que efectivamente la política comercial de la Unión Europea con terceros países es una política de globalización, de desarrollo de acuerdos comerciales internacionales con todos los países del mundo. En ese sentido, entiendo de que efectivamente el acuerdo con Vietnam ha sido un acuerdo en el cual hay un contingente eh, en, en, un, en un desmantelamiento eh, en un periodo de tiempo, en un horizonte temporal, en función de lo que eh, la media de los últimos tres años eh, pues, eh, se estaba exportando al mercado de la Unión Europea. Eso significa de que eh, bueno, pues, la Unión Europea sigue con esa política de apertura a nivel internacional. El mercado de la Unión Europea es un mercado eh, importante de consumo de conserva de atún. Eh, lo hemos visto en los datos. Eh, Ecuador es el primer exportador a la Unión Europea de conservas de atún eh, y eso significa de que bueno, también los productores europeos eh, tienen su, uh, su acicate para seguir conquistando este mercado de la Unión Europea, que es un mercado donde se transforma en la Unión Europea. Pero eh, bueno, en función de las necesidades de consumo, que hay, pues realmente pueden llegar eh, bueno, pues, eh, eh, productos de otras zonas del mundo. ¿no? Eh, la política comercial de la Unión Europea, de la Digitrade, va a seguir eh, de cara al futuro. Yo creo que a lo mejor con esta situación que se ha creado con el COVID-19 y la pandemia, eh, bueno, pues se, se ralentizará en función de cómo están los países eh, en un momento determinado, en función de sus demandas. Y eso significará que, que, bueno, que el mercado de las conservas de atún eh, en los últimos cinco años permanece bastante estable. Observamos un comportam ese comportamiento estable. Los últimos acontecimientos incluso permiten ser optimistas, pero a la vez cautelosos, puesto que el COVID-19 desata una crisis económica y se predice una restricción del consumo, por lo que se hace necesario fomentar dicho consumo. Es uno de los aspectos importantes liquidez económica y eh, eh, activar la demanda. Y en este contexto hay que tener en cuenta que los consumidores cada vez están más concienciados en el consumo responsable, enfocado a la sostenibilidad, conveniencia y al tema de la salud. ¿no? Yo creo que el futuro está en los nuevos modelos de negocio basados en la tecnología e innovación, por lo tanto la necesidad de innovar. 
Eh, yo diría también que esta visión en la que tienen las personas del atún, si quieren encontrar el éxito en los negocios y, y prosperar en este escenario, requiere un nuevo enfoque totalmente distinto. ¿no? Y, y no es posible encontrar un escenario posible a largo plazo, salvo el optimismo y la confianza, ¿no? en función de cómo nos encontramos en este momento, y, y porque solo ha habido cierta incertidumbre y espontaneidad. ¿no? Y aquí me quedo. Thank you, Mr. Wan, for that um, response. I have a question here for Arnab. Are a majority of consumers in the Middle East market concerned with tuna sustainability issue? Uh, no. Honestly, at the majority of consumers, there are small pockets. It's something new. At this point of time, the tuna sustainability is not a concern for majority of this thing. But I think in the very near future, things would change. All right. Um, We've come to the last question for this tuna webinar. Um, this last question is uh, a very important question for um, for the participants, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that they would like to know. Um, with this new reality that we have to face, what do you think will characterize the global tuna market from now till the end of the year, in the long, in the short and long term? Um, I'll start off with Fatima. Well, um, looking at the market trends, particularly for buying imported tuna, uh, it reflects consumer's choice, meaning the market needs more product and, uh, uh, and is being replenished with imports that is up to, up to more the uh, figures that we get on the major markets, it shows increased importing trends of canned tuna in the United States, in the European Union market, in uh, uh, even in the smaller markets uh, in Europe as well. And but um, uh, Arnob has already said something about the Middle East market. But mine is what I would what I will say here is uh, uh, being. A shelf-stable product is has it, it has its own, uh, or should I say, uh, quality uh, that attracts household as well. Even in in Asia, you see, okay, the choice is for fresh frozen product, but at the same time, they like to people like to have few cans at home just in case of emergency or uh, when they want to have something quick. So that kind of trend will continue. And most important thing I feel personally that it's a shelf stable product. I can buy it. I don't have to worry whether it is it's get melted or it gets spoiled. It stays on the shelf and it has a very long shelf life. So that's the most positive thing among the seafood categories that we deal with for canned can tuna or processed tuna or tuna in pouch or tuna in cups. That will continue. Uh, talking about uh, Asian market, uh, countries that produce canned tuna, for example, Philippines, the preference is quite strong for for canned and uh, canned tuna and tuna tuna like products, like even tuna sausage, uh, that kind of products in cans in the Philippines. In the Pacific, also the demand will continue to be strong. In, uh, produced in the in Papua New Guinea and also in Fiji, distributed in the regional markets. In Thailand, distributed in the region and beyond. So uh, the trend will be there, and supermarket will definitely in this region would like to have stocks uh, in case of emergency, even if, if the second wave of pandemic comes back, uh, which is already uh, we see in many many countries. Um, so the positive demand for processed tuna will be there. For frozen and uh, fresh tuna, uh, I, I do see 
quite a weakening trend in the absence of uh, any comeback in the food service or the restaurant trade sector. Um, Mr. Arnab. Okay, uh, I would uh, ask people to be, or to be concerned or alert of a few things with this COVID thing. One is uh, the demand as it comes in because I think this uh, fear would remain in consumers about you know, keeping the pantry filled just in case a quarantine or a lockdown happens again, at least in the near, near term. Uh, we should also keep an alertness of the disposable income that consumers will have. You know, how does the job market work? How are the economy happening in countries for the next few months? And the third thing that we should look at also is tuna as a commodity, as a business, is a pretty expensive product. So all these government tranches that has been given up, the fact that the interest rate has been brought down lower, what impact would it have? Would the inflation pick up? Because, you know, now we have got huge amount of bailout money being given out uh, into the system and uh, there is no production behind them. So how does the monetary policy of the world or the dollar economy or the economies are managed? That would have a concern. They would impact our products. Uh, and because at the end of the day, the supply chain is managed by the cash or the capital available in the system, the interest rate that is there, the cost of money. And those will be the three things to be looked at. You know, like the, the fear factor, the scare uh, in the consumers and how they behave. Uh, how much disposable income consumers have in themselves, so how the demand pattern will flow. The third one is how the interest rate money or how they hold their whole whole governance of the industry would depend on that. So these are the three things I think we should be careful about. Thank you, um, Arnab. Uh, Mr. Wan. is the need in European Union to dispel the atmosphere of discouragement and weariness among consumers. We have to be optimists and all of us together manage to generate confidence despite all the problem and difficulty. If there is uh, confidence, there is consumption. If there is consumption, the system works. Um, and lastly, Mr. John Connolly. I think I'd, um, two short term and one longer term. Um, on the short term, looking at the economic lockdowns or the, the closing off of primarily the food service sector for our part of the, uh, the economy, that obviously has a negative impact for non-canned tuna sales, as was discussed, whether it be sushi or, uh, or other higher end tuna that's often served at restaurants. Um, but on the flip side, that's a, of unfortunately a benefit to, uh, to others that serve uh, or provide canned tuna uh, to, the, to those that uh, want it at home. Uh, the second short term issue that uh, we would look at or encourage folks to look at is the issue of uh, supply chain potential supply chain disruptions if production centers um, for canning of tuna or loining of tuna um, begin to see outbreaks in the workers at the production centers um, where the fish is first processed after the boat uh, begin to feel uncomfortable and don't go to work. Um, that is of concern to us uh, because we've seen that in other seafood sectors, but also other protein sectors. And then on a more optimistic note, uh, we view this as an opportunity. Uh, we view this current challenge as an opportunity to, uh, to ensure that the gains that we've made with new consumers or returning consumers, they see the kind of innovation that uh, has been made and will be made in the tuna industry. And so those consumers uh, kind of come back to tuna and tuna has been reintroduced to them as a, as a versatile, healthy, um, delicious protein that they can enjoy, not just in a tuna sandwich, but in a variety of ways throughout the day. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. John Conley. A uh, very strong points that you had mentioned there. Um, thank you all to the, the panelists for providing uh, those responses to the, the questions. Um, I hope that the uh, participants are able to take uh, away some of the, uh, the facts and information that um, the panelists have provided. Uh, just before we wrap up with this um, we webinar, we have some uh, points to, uh, some not, uh, notice to, announcements to make to all the participants. Um, we have a series, uh, a series of webinars that are uh, coming up in the few weeks and months. We have this Mary Culture webinar uh, that is scheduled to happen on the, the 17th of August. And also we have a TUNA webinar uh, three, our third webinar, TUNA webinar three, uh, on the 9th of September. Uh, the title of this webinar is on certification and technology. Uh, we also have our pre TUNA 2021 event that's going to be uh, scheduled on the 14th of October. Um, so all these events will be up on our website. So please keep a lookout for this um, advertisement and promotions on the website, on our InfoFish website, as well as our social media uh, page. Um, just to remind everyone, we have the poll questions up on the on the Zoom uh, Zoom screen. Uh, please feel free to uh, fill up those poll questions. Uh, also, for those that are that have been asking for um, the recordings of this webinar, we will have this the, the recording of this webinar um, over to you uh, probably by tomorrow or uh, yeah probably by tomorrow or before the end of this week. Uh, we'll have this um, video up on our YouTube channel. So please um, have a look through our YouTube channel uh, and subscribe as well uh, on our channel. Uh, so uh, basically that is all from us here at InfoFish. Thank you so much for uh, participating in this webinar. Uh, we will see you again in the next Tuna webinar, uh, probably by on the 9th of September. Uh, so from all of us here at Team InfoFish, thank you so much. Goodbye and be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Nice to Bye. see Bye. you all across the world. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> My voice was getting drier.